Well, welcome everyone. Welcome. Um, obviously, Tim Burgess is going to talk about the history of a brief history of vaccination. And you know that Tim has been uh, a local pharmacist with Joe Price and onward for many, many, many years. I wasn't a pharmacist for Joe. What's that? I wasn't a pharmacist for Joe. You just worked in the store. The store. Yeah. But you yeah. thought it was a good idea. I went to school. Were you a tech were you ever? Like, behind, you were behind the oh, yeah, my door now. Was the mic on? That means you have to actually can, talk to us. Can anybody hear me without the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> better with it. Tim, you deal with drugs, eh? You I know, but this means I'm going to go like this. Uh, oh, they, they won't go up? It, it doesn't extend any higher. How's that? Yeah, that's good. Right. Okay. All right, in case you don't know, I'm Tim Burgess. Uh, I see faces here that I grew up with, and, you know, uh, so cool. I see you know, Sandy in the back there. She and I grew up in the same neighborhood. And Don, my baby's had his kids. And interestingly enough, when I was Can a pharmacist. Can you come a little closer and speak slower? I suppose with us from hearing you. Okay. That's better. It's going to be awkward. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when Don Putney uh, moved across the street me, I babysat his kids. And then, interestingly enough, when I was in pharmacy school, uh, one of the pharmacists I worked with, Dr. Zano, was teaching an over the counter course, and Don was a guest speaker for one of my classes, so pressure's on. Uh, so my background is, uh, I have a bachelor's degree in uh, psychology from the University of Maine, uh, and then uh, that was useless, so I uh, went back to school for pharmacy, uh, and I graduated in uh, uh, 94 from pharmacy school. So next year it'll be 30 years, it's not 30 years now. Uh, but I've been in the pharmacy business since 1984. Um, only been immunizing for the last 10 years or so. Um, it's fairly new for pharmacists to be able to do that. Um, and we do go through training. We don't just, you know, they don't just hand us needles and start stabbing people. Um, so I had a video that I tried to do the last time I was here. And that's what happened. <laughs> it's a YouTube video. And it's, it's, it basically just showed the population of the world over time. And there were all these little yellow dots that represented a million people, and it, it just goes through the, uh, the time and shows all these dots showing up. But what was important is I want to show the Black Plague, which is the bubonic plague back in the 1300s. And you can literally watch just the lights just blink out, and every one of those is a million. It was, it was you know, like more than half the population of, of Europe was decimated by this. And, and the bubonic plague actually still exists. You can, it's in California. It's, in, you know, it's just very difficult for humans to get it. It's carried by rodents. Uh, back in the plague days, there were a lot of rodents and, and people were exposed to them. So it was you know, one of those things we catch it. But then when you get to the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s, it's like fireworks. You can watch the, 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 uh, the, the dots just start exploding on the screen. One billion, two billion, three billion, just right after the other. And that's because of modern medicine, modern technology, sanitation, you know, uh, uh, aseptic technique, things like that. So, let me see if I can do this. I don't know if this has been sitting too long. There we go. All right, so what is a vaccine? Uh, vaccine, I'm just gonna read this. Uh, substance use to stimulate the production of antibodies and provide immunity against one or several diseases. Uh, they're pre uh, prepared from uh, viruses, they can be killed, they can be uh, byproducts of, a, vac of, a, of a, a virus or a bacteria, and they can be synthetic. Um, they're treated to act as an antigen, which is something that's your body, that's far into the body, and your body's going to attack it with, and make antibodies against it. Um, it tries to do it without making you sick, or it tries not to give you the disease. Um, the types of vaccines we have, uh, historically, they started off with one called, it was, well, they, they started with variolation, I'll talk about that at length, but the real vaccines started off with um, live attenuated vaccines, which is basically a, a virus or a bacteria that's kind of weakened quite a bit through heat or just let it sit on the air or something. Um, the one we have nowadays, that's the only one that I, that I give is the measles, and measles, mushroom, rubella. 
measles is a live attenuated. You can, you can technically still get um, measles from the measles vaccine, um, but it's super rare and you know, I, you, you're really not gonna get it. Um, the next one is a killed or an inactivated. I use killed, uh, you'll find out in a second, viruses are not living things. So you're not really killing a virus, you're inactivating it. Um, and then you have um, viral vector vaccines like the Johnson & Johnson COVID. What that does is it takes a piece of the protein from the virus and it inserts it into an adenovirus, like a cold virus or something. And they use that, they kill that, and then they use that to put into your body to react. Uh, there is toxin, toxoid virus, like tetanus, uh, which is a, a product that's, that comes out of, you know, bacteria use the, the bad stuff that comes out and, and, and make viruses out of that, I mean, make vaccines out of that. And then there's the, the uh, recombinant, the man-made vaccines, like we have one called Recombivax, which is for hepatitis. Uh, so those are the type of vaccines that exist. And that's the bad guy right there. Um, that's a coronavirus. And do you know why they call it the coronavirus? I gave it away right there. It looks like a crown. Um, those little spiky things make it look like a crown. We'll, we're going to circle back to that in the end. And I'll, I'll try to leave some time if people have questions about what's going on with that nowadays and what, you know, the treatments and things. That is a bacteria cell. Bacteria cells are living cells. Um, they have, sometimes they have these flagella things to to navigate around, they have floating DNA inside of them. They, uh, they can multiply on their own. Um, they don't need any help. Um, they're mostly surface uh, infections, um, skin infections, they can get into organs, things like that. Good thing about that is we have antibiotics and that can treat it, but they do have some vaccines that fight certain bacterial infections. Um, interesting enough, as you sit here, as you sit here, each and every one of you probably has somewhere to the neighborhood of 3.8 times 10 to the 13th power, that's 13 zeros, bacteria on and about your body. You have as many bacteria in your body and on your body right now as you have human cells. So, you're quite a zoo. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and most of them are good. Most of the bacteria are good. You have them in your gut that help you with digestion. You have staph you have bacteria on your, on your bodies that can fight like fungal infections and any kind of infection to the skin. Um, sometimes they go bad and you, know, you need antibiotics. And luckily we have antibiotics and so it's easy, easy to treat. Um, there's only like 70 some odd uh, bacteria. Hang on a second. I got 70, there's 73 pathogenic bacteria. There is probably estimated to be about a trillion species of bacteria. 73 of them right now are basically pathogenic to us. We've luckily found them. They, they, they can infect us. So if I had the choice, I'd rather have a bacterial infection than this guy. Yeah. As a virus, virus, there was a quote that I found. It was. Um, yeah a couple named Gene and Peter Medwar. I don't know who they are, but I found the quote. And the quote was that a virus is bad news wrapped in protein. They're not living. They cannot multiply on their own. They cannot move about on their own. Um, they're just packed with a code inside of them that gets inside of your cells and makes more viruses. Um, I liken it to, if you ever see a shark, you see a shark's eyes, they're just dead and scared. That's what these things are, they're just scared. This is what we're fighting with uh, the coronavirus. And what happens with this, these viruses is they'll, they'll spread through coughing, sneezing. They can live on surfaces, but they don't move around. But you, you touch the surface and you go to the windows of the world, you touch your eyes, everybody wants to rub their eyes. And that's where a lot of these things go. Um, once they get in your body, they, they will, they will get, it, get to a cell and they'll, the cell wall will help it get its genetic properties inside of your cell. It'll pirate your cell and your cell will start making all the proteins and things that are needed to make more viruses. Uh, you can have up to 10,000 new viruses 
produced inside of one human cell in eight hours. And you think about how many cells you have in your body and what happens and what, the, what, what that means for numbers. It's staggering. And people are always curious about, well, why are we having a mutation? What, what we have mutations? Codes mutate. So what happens is you, you can imagine 10,000 viruses being produced. There's going to be some mistakes. And they estimate that there's the average virus can have one mistake per 1,000 viruses, which you know, may not say if you have 10,000, it's only 10. But think of all the millions and billions of cells you have in your body and how many of them are making more viruses and how many mistakes that is. It's not a calculated mistake. It's not done on purpose. But with uh, what happens is that viruses don't want to die. And I, and I want to give it a human aspect to it. It doesn't want to die. But it wants to be more transmissible. And it wants to be less rare. It doesn't want to kill you. Once, once a virus kills you, it's, it's not going anywhere. All right? So it doesn't want that. It wants to spread. Um, so it gets into your cells, and it makes all these, these replications. Viruses are the number one biological entity in the biosphere. So in the world, there's more viruses than anything that's living. And I shouldn't say that because it's really not living. Um, but it's, it's, it's just a, a nasty, nasty little thing. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to go to my notes once in a while here. So, enough of the science of viruses. There, there are a couple other little nasty little organisms. Uh, one is protozoa, which is dysentery, malaria, uh, sleeping sickness, which comes from the TT fly. Um, we don't really worry about that too much in this area. Um, then you have, you know, parasites like, you know, you tapeworms and things like that. I don't know if anybody's been watching HBO lately. There's a show on called The Last of Us. That's a new twist on the end of the world. They use fungus as the bad guy. And it, it's, it's based on a lot of true things. There are some funguses, or fungi, um, that have taken over, can take over um, insects and kill them and take over their bodies. And they're basically going to be zombie insects based on these funguses. And, uh, and so that's the basis of this series. It, it takes over humans, makes them zombies, and they spread these fungus, and the fungus can kill you know. uh, We don't worry about that. The, the, the major player of that was HIV. Some of you developed HIV and then developed AIDS from that uh, would lose their uh, resistance to fungi, and that's what killed a lot of, a lot of people who had AIDS. Uh, they just couldn't fight the fungal infection. But we, you know, we have toenail fungus infections, um, you know, jock itch, things that are Pretty much harmless, but once a fungus a fungal infection gets inside of you and it takes hold, it, it can be it can be pretty, pretty damaging and pretty deadly. My first time using the uh, Google Slides thing. It's kind of cool. I like it. <laughs> what? Google Slides. Oh, think. Get back to the virus for a second. One of the things about viruses is nothing is safe. That will invade a bacteria, so that can get inside of a bacteria. Bacteria is a huge compared to viruses. And that'll, that'll actually invade, they call them bacteriophages. They'll, they'll get inside of a, of a bacteria, which actually sometimes is helpful because you can make certain um, vaccines by introducing the virus inside of the bacteria, and then you kill the bacteria and it works as a vaccine. All right, so now the, the, uh, the main points of this symposium. <laughs> the history of vaccines. So this is... Um, the first vaccines were done by the Chinese, and they, they estimated it was probably 100 BC. Wow. Wow. And what they would do is they, uh, they had smallpox back then, and they would scrape scabs and goopy stuff off of these people who had active pox, and they would dry it out and form a powder, and then they'd blow it up your nose. And it worked. It, you know, it killed a lot of people too, but it worked. <laughs> and the, tech, the technique is called uh, variolation. Uh, it's a, a form of um, inoculation. And um, they kept it very secretive for many, many, many years. Uh, by proximity, the turkey was next door, and they said, hey, that looks like something we might want to try. And so they stole the technology and started using it, the Ottomans. And then it wasn't until about the time of Columbus that um, they uh, started using it in Europe. 
and it was mostly like royalty and you know the well off. But um, it, it it migrated over there all the time. It was too bad because if they had found it a little earlier, they could have vaccinated Columbus and his crew, and they wouldn't have decimated the natives when they got here. Um, but uh, the, the the Chinese have always been secretive about everything. I mean, I think they might have. They may have tried to put it up on a balloon and send it to <laughs> uh, that, would have been, that would have been something. Um, all right, so this is just a quick little timeline. I'm not going to go over every single vaccine that's been coming out. I just kind of want to go over some of the, uh, just touch on some historical type of things. But um, 1796 is when somebody actually did an experiment. So nobody knew what this variolation was doing. They, don't, they didn't know what was causing the problems. They just knew people got these pox on them. And if they took something off and smeared it on somebody, it, it helped. But they didn't know why or where it was coming from. Um, so it wasn't until 1796 that somebody actually did an experiment. Um, then the vaccine started with rabies and cholera and then just moved on up until we actually have a vaccine against Ebola. And you haven't heard much about Ebola recently, but that one there killed people fast. But it also spread fast, and it was bloodborne. So the, the way that one worked was it would basically liquefy your insides, and it would just come out, project on. People around you would get it. You couldn't get on an airplane and get it to the United States because it would be dead before that. You, know, you, could, you can control it and keep it localized pretty much. Um, so that's just a quick little timeline. I'm, like I said, I'm not going to hit every vaccine. I just uh, think it's more interesting. All right, this is Cotton Mather. He was a Puritan minister in the colonies, and uh, I, don't, I don't know a whole lot about him. I, might, might, I thought that he had something to do with witch trials. Uh, Tom, is that, do you know? He wasn't in the witch trials. He was in the witch trials? No. no he wasn't, okay. No, but he was, was one of the, the leading clergymen of his day. Right, right. I, I, I read that he actually wrote a letter to the witch trials telling them not to use spectral evidence as a, as a means of persecuting. But anyways, he, he was, um, he had a slave gifted to him. His name was uh, Onesimus. And Onesimus had a scar on him that he explained to Cotton was the variolation technique. And he, and he told him that he was immune from smallpox because of it. And this piqued his curiosity. So Cotton, Cotton Mather actually um, got his a friend who was a physician. His name was Xavier Boylston. And he had him, asked him and begged him to do this technique on about 250 people. And uh, it worked. And 3% of them that were exposed to smallpox actually died from smallpox. But in the general population, it was about 14%. So it was, it, it was working. And the way they would do is they would cut, cut your skin, and they would take the, the, the pox product and smear it into the, into the uh, wound. Another one they would do is they would take a needle and thread and they would pass it through somebody's active pox, and then they'd run it through the thick of your thumb, um, and uh, you would get protection that way, and you could die that way. And, uh, you can imagine there's no sterile technique back then. You know, they'd probably use the same needle on everybody. George Washington mandated the troops be and, uh, have this procedure done um, because he was getting losing so many people in battle. And so George Washington had it done, his troops had it done, uh, John Adams had it done, and when John Adams had it done, they thought they'd prep his body for it by giving him a concoction that involves mercury. <laughs> and most of his teeth, he was going to lose, he almost lost all of his teeth because he could literally almost reach in and pull his teeth out. He was very, very sick just from that. Um, so, you know, been around a long time, and very famous people were very big proponents of it. And, but there were also people who were opponents of it. There were a lot of people who did not, who didn't believe in it, didn't want it, and they were violently against it. Somebody actually threw a, a makeshift grenade through his window uh, with a note attached to it. And the note said, and I will quote, Cotton Mather, you dog, damn you, I'll inoculate you with this, with a pox upon you. And of course, the grenade didn't go off right now, but the note was intact. And, you know. But uh, he, uh, he furthered the cause of, uh, of uh, this very relation. All right, this is kind of a funny little sketch. And this is, uh, this is sort of, you can tell, if you look cold closely, these people have all kinds of cows coming out of different parts of their body. <laughs> all right, 
that represents cowpox. Cowpox is a uh, is a close cousin to smallpox. Okay. This is Edward Jenner. This is 1796, that era, right around there. This is the first time that somebody actually did basically an experiment with uh, vaccination variolation. And you're gonna see a running theme here. He did that to a eight-year-old boy. He, uh, he found out through uh, an acquaintance who was a milkmaid that milkmaids who had contracted cowpox were immune from smallpox. And so he decided to test the theory. So he, uh, he found a, a, a milkmaid named Sarah, Sarah Nelms, who had contracted cowpox from a cow named Blossom. <laughs> and he variolated this eight-year-old boy as an experiment. And he got some mild symptoms. And then about a week or two later, he intentionally gave the kid smallpox to see if it worked. And it did. It was fine. No way. Yeah. <laughs> um, interestingly enough, Blossom's pelt is framed in a hospital, St. George's Hospital in London. Oh, and right. is, and another, another interesting fact, um, does anybody know the Latin word for cow? Or Spanish? Baca. 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 Vaca. That's what you get. Vaccine. Yeah. We did all learn something. So, so I'm glad. I'm glad they named. I'm glad they named it in honor of the cow. You know, but they. So basically, vaccine is named after after the cow. Um, so he published a paper in like uh, 1801 or something to to uh, show this off, but. It's funny, he gets credit for this, for the, for the discovery of this procedure, which has been around, like I said, since 100 BC. So because he did it, wrote about it, he's the one that gets kind of the credit for it. So, but eight-year-old boy, how power to you. What year? That was uh, 1796 to about 1801. He published in 1801. This is uh, President James Madison. He, uh, he, he, proposed this, or if this actually existed, it was the National Vaccine Agency. All right, and that was 1813-ish, uh, that area. And what that did was it, it, it mandated that uh, the post office deliver for free any package that was under a half an ounce that contained the materials to do, do the variolation for smallpox. So that every citizen of the United States, if they wanted to, could get it, and they could send it to them for free. Um, so interesting that in 1813, you've got a government agency already for vaccines. All right, this is the, this is the this is this guy here is just we won't have we won't have any kind of vaccines, antibodies, anything without this guy. This is Larry Pres Larry Larry Pastor. It's Larry Pastor. Somebody's not thinking Larry Bird. Um, Louis Pasteur uh, was. I mean, pasteurization, fermentation, all that stuff. He's, he's just, he's the guy from France. He was born in um, Dole, France, which is famous for the Wolfman. He, uh, that's where the Wolfman race came from. Uh, he failed his first science exam. He lost some family um, to typhoid fever, so he dedicated the rest of his life, he was a chemist, um, dedicated the rest of his life to trying to find out what's going on. And so, he was doing an experiment with anthrax. He was killing chickens with anthrax. And he'd have a broth of anthrax, he'd inject it into the chickens and just kind of see what happened and try to figure out what's going on. One of the experiments, he had a couple things of broth ready to go and he was going on vacation. So he had an assistant named Cham Chamberlain, I think it was. Yeah, Charles Chamberlain, 29 years old. And he said, listen, I'm going on vacation. Can you finish up the experiment? Sure. Well, he's like me, he just forgot to. And then he went on vacation. And he left the broth on the table. And he comes back from vacation, and he sees it, and he goes, oh boy, I forgot. So he decided to keep the experiment going. So he took the broth that had been sitting there, and he injected the chickens with it. Nothing happened. None of the chickens got sick. Not at all, but the past would just kill them. So he said, oh, there's something wrong. 
I better do it again. So he got a fresh batch of anthrax, good strong anthrax, and gave it to the chickens, and they all survived. And now he's like, what the heck? And so Louis Pasteur comes back from vacation. Now this guy's dejected, and he has to go tell him what he did, tell him God it is. Well, one of one of Louis Pasteur's uh, famous phrases is uh, chance, uh, chance. Chance favors the prepared mind. Yes! Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do you hear okay. Come on up. Chance favors the, the prepared, prepared mind. mind. Yes. Yeah. So he came back and rather than being mad at his assistant, he said, do it again. Exactly the same way. And it worked again. So it's basically, that's the first true like vaccine. It's live attenuated. The vaccine, the broth of anthrax weakened over time. And so they gave the weakened vaccine, the well, vaccine, they gave the weakened broth to these chickens, and they formed immune response to it. Um, it's amazing. And then he came up with a, a rabies vaccine, a cholera vaccine, but the rabies vaccine is interesting because, again, uh, he had a little boy local that got attacked and mauled by a rabid dog. And rabies is fatal without treatment in most cases. Um, so the kid was going to die. He's not a doctor, but what he did is the mother of the child begged him to try to help. So he took his vaccine, which was still experimental, and he gave the kid a series of 12 shots over 12 days. And he survived. It, it cured his vaccine. It was the first time that was done. Um, the child's name was um, Meister, Joseph Meister. And interestingly enough, he grew up to work at the Pasteur Institute in France. A sad uh, side note to that was that he, uh, during World War II, um, he heard the Nazis were going to invade, so he sent his family away. And he stayed back to kind of protect the, uh, the Institute. And um, there's one of two stories. Um, one, he heard that his family was killed, and so he took his own life. The second one, that he was, which I like to believe, is he was protecting the Institute from the Nazis and was killed by the Nazis. Uh, I'd rather believe that one. But, uh, uh, all we have for vaccines and stuff is really this guy. Mm -hmm. Just just an amazing, amazing human being. Okay. So the reason I show these guys, these guys um, work with toxins, uh, especially uh, von Behren. Um, the Chavisaburo Kitasato <laughs> was his mentor, basically. Uh, uh, Bering won the Nobel Prize for his research with toxins, and uh, what they would do is they would inject, um, I believe it was uh, diphtheria toxins, and they would inject them to guinea pigs, and then they would harvest the blood, and then they would find an animal, they would give, dip, they'd give diphtheria to an animal, and treat them with the with sera from the uh, guinea pigs, and it would cure them. And the reason I bring that up is because um, with COVID, one of the treatments they use is serotherapy. And this is the basis of it. You get somebody who had COVID, and you get blood from them, and they can take the products out of it that are going to save lives, and it can help cure it. We never use it as like a vaccine type of thing, but um, it can be. And that's where like tetanus toxin comes from. It's from the toxins from the tetanus. Uh, but uh, that's why these two guys are important. Like I said, he won the uh, Nobel Prize. I don't know why they didn't give it to him. He was a partner with him, but maybe because he was just the advisor. And of course, you know companies immediately are going to start taking advantage. And so this is the Mulford uh, company. They are the, they're the, um, they became Merck Sharp and Dome. Ah. Um, guinea pigs were too small to get enough blood out of them. So they used horses. They would give the horse a series of shots with the diphtheria and get to a point where the, they felt there was time and they would harvest the blood. They'd have to destroy the horse and they got the blood on the jugular. Um, but these guys were awarded the grand prize. Thank God. All right, so this is um, Calcutta, India, 1894. This is the first time they used an experimental and control group, which most most science, you, you kind of should do that. Kind of sad when it comes to medicine because you're going to have to give a, a group of people placebos that aren't going to work and they could get sick. Um, Calcutta, um, 
they, they did this experiment with a lot of people, very successful. Um, 1894, and, um, I, I don't know the name oh. of the, all the scientists that did this, but uh, they're on the bottom there. Okay, so during the, the, the Second World War, Britain would uh, uh, give vaccinations. This was um, for typhoid. Um, during the Spanish-American War, five military camps in the U.S. Um, had a death toll of over 1,600 soldiers from typhoid, as compared to about 280 deaths on the battlefield. You're safer in the battle than you are in the camp. World War I, it was mandated the troops get typhoid vac vaccines. They had 200 and some odd deaths out of 4 million troops. So vaccines, you know, they're, 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 they work. I mean, this is a good example of it. Okay, so vaccines aren't without their problems. <laughs> in St. Louis and Camden, New Jersey, uh, back in, uh, uh, I think this was in 19, 1902 in that area, they had some contaminated batches of, um, of vaccine and it killed, killed a few people. And so um, the, the government at the time came up with the hygienic lab of the Department of Public Health. That building is the NIH, National Institute of Health, that's what this department became. That's why there's a picture of that photo there. Um, so that became the uh, National Institute of Health. Um, and they also, in 1902, came up with the Biologic, Biologic Control Act, which uh, regulated virus, virus products, analogs, all that, 1902. My grandfather was born two years after that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the Su Supreme Court, 1905, Jacobson versus Massachusetts. I don't know if anybody's heard of this one uh, because it did come up recently when there were mandates for vaccines in, in, in states, and so people were fighting it. This is 1905. There was a mandate in Massachusetts that everybody get vaccinated, and Jacobson fought it, and it went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld the mandate. Ooh. 1905. Comes around again, this, you know. What was the vaccine for? Um, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. It might have been typhoid. It's probably typhoid or something like that. There were, I mean, we didn't have uh, vaccines for uh, a lot of stuff back then, but it, but it was just the mandates that, you know, you know, that was sort of the point of the mandate. Um, but Jason reversed. That was the precedent, and that was contested recently and uh, overturned in a lot of, overturned mostly, but not totally. Uh, so that's what that, that, that was brought I, up. I think your ruling was at the state because how did the state issue that yeah. the state had the right, and then with COVID they ruled that you know, the federal government right. doesn't have the right to implement right. it. It's still right. is a state, and that makes yeah, sense. the federal 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 issue. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's with so we're going back to the 1905. Yeah. There was issues, you know, with all that. All right, and here's the Spanish flu. Um, no vaccine for the Spanish flu. Um, they tried. Uh, but they were looking. They were looking for love in all the wrong places. Um, they thought it was a bacteria, so they were going after that. And they, they made a lot of progress with bacterial vaccines and stuff. But they didn't discover the um, the uh, uh, what the virus until it was you know 1930s flu virus, um, and they didn't come up with a vaccine for that until 1940. Uh, I lost my. I didn't know her, but. Uh, my, my grandfather's sister was 16 and she perished at this time. She died of the Spanish flu. Um, and so, family history. Yeah. All right, so here's another, you know, it was always, there's always controversy when it comes to vaccines. This was uh, a mob led by a, uh, a retired lieutenant. Um, Lieutenant, uh, lieutenant, retired lieutenant uh, from the army and a uh, uh, city councilman, and they led an armed revolt against um, mandated vaccines in uh, Georgetown, Delaware, and they they stopped it. They they actually stopped the vaccine mandate, but of course they didn't stop going to jail. Uh, they were 
they were arrested for that. That was uh, 1920. All right, does anybody know who Eddie Cantor was? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Eddie Cantor in 1938 on uh, a radio, I don't know if it was a radio commercial or a radio broadcast of some sort, suggested that people send a dime to President Roosevelt to help fight polio. And all those envelopes have dimes in it. It was hugely, hugely successful, and it became the March of Dimes. Uh, and Roosevelt had polio himself. All right, 1947 was the last smallpox case in New York City. It was a, a, a gentleman coming up from Mexico who was going to Maine. And he stopped in at um, New York, his bus stopped in New York to switch buses, but he became very sick. And uh, they ended up sending him to Bellevue and he ended up going to the contagious uh, disease unit. And he died several days later. Um, right after that, New York um, had this huge push to have everybody get vaccinated against smallpox, and it was like six million people, and it was huge. And so that was the that was the last case in New York, New York uh, City. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna circle back to the uh, smallpox in a second too. But this is uh, Jonas Saw. He's another one of those brilliant minds that is just you know incredible, but. Um, as the theme goes, he developed the polio vaccine and then experimented on kids. But his was even worse. He did, he did, this, he did the experiments on kids who were institutionalized mm -hmm. and were physically and mentally challenged kids. They survived and it, it worked. He had three different polio vaccines though. He gave each one a different one and they all were able to fight the different versions they had. Um, and none of them died and it worked. But, you know, he, he stood behind his product and so before, it, while it was still in the experimental stage, he vaccinated his whole family and himself. And then they, uh, they moved on to doing a trial with millions of kids. And uh, it, this is a, this is a killed, a killed vaccine. So you're, you cannot get polio from this vaccine that's killed. Um, there are some, there were some polio vaccines, I believe, um, uh, I want to say there was a nasal version, there were some that were partially killed, um, and you could still get polio from it. Uh, there's an oral version, I think, that's live. Sabin. What's that? Sabin. 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 Yeah. Yeah, so, very important. I mean, if you ever seen pictures of people's in iron lungs and stuff, this was, and, you know, because I wasn't alive then. This, this was probably extraordinarily scary time. All right, so a bunch of companies started making the vaccine, and some of them didn't do such a good job. Um, some of them didn't kill the vaccines enough. And so there were hundreds of people who became paralyzed, hundreds of people, there were tens of People died, um, and this is the uh, Surgeon General, and he just suspended the whole manufacture of polio vaccines for a while until they could square it away. Um, too many, too many cooks. What vaccine? The polio. Yeah, yeah. There was there was a bunch of versions, and some of them they didn't do so well. All right, so this is the. Uh, 1971, measles, mumps, and rubella. This is one of the first vaccines where you put a few in one vaccine and so you don't have to stick the kid three times. And when I tell you, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> I've had to do kids, kids come in for their COVID and a flu shot. I don't know why parents do this. They bring them in for both. I know you want to get it out of the way, but yeah. I've been there one fight's enough. <laughs> Two fight is... Yeah. Yeah. That's why doctors don't have a give vaccine. No, the do it. no, they don't even do that anymore. They have us do it. Right. Yeah. Just go to your pharmacy. They'll do it for you. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Corporate yeah. America. Yeah, yeah. I've got so many bruises on my legs from kids kicking me. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, you have to you're doing this to try to hold his arm still. I'm going to, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but we so were, we were in CVS one day when you were trying to give a 
Yeah. The kids howling. No, <laughs> don't do that, don't do that. That's because I was beating them at that point. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, they, it's. I, I've only had one situation where a child has been yeah. so bad that they just yeah. we just couldn't do it. Yeah. We just couldn't do it. But you know, it's a it's a necessary. Okay, this is um, Rahimu Banu. So the last case of variable major, which is a, a, a form of smallpox. Um, she got it when she was two, she survived. She had scars the rest of her life. But this guy here, this is Ali Malin. He is actually the last case of smallpox in the world, 1977. That shows you, that, that is a testament to the vaccine. Um, the, the vaccine for smallpox was so big in this world, it was just, it was, it was everybody would get it. Uh, man did it everywhere. He's the last case. Um, sadly enough, well, he survived and he actually became an advocate and an immunizer. He actually would, was immunized people. He was a Somali cook. Sadly, he died of malaria in 2013, and they're right now in trials with a malaria vaccine. So, uh, last, last case of smallpox. And just some uh, advertising for the smallpox that get paid on zero. There's actually, I believe, if I'm if I'm right, there's a there's a strain of smallpox that's kept by the CDC in Atlanta and one in Moscow. Yeah. Yes. Just in case. Yeah. Yeah. And interestingly enough, circle back to measles. The measles vaccines we have today uh, used there was a there was a measles vir uh, virus that used from 1954, and that that family tree from that virus is still used today to make vaccines. Um, so, th so I have to, I have to say, my my brother did these did these uh, slides for me, and uh, I, I picked the slides out. He did the captions, and she's getting a COVID vaccine. But I just wanted the military showing somebody in the military getting a shot. So my brother did this, and they stopped vaccinating and switched to tattoos. She's got beautiful tattoos on that arm. That's a beautiful sleeve. The colors are amazing. <laughs> Uh, but that's 1990. They just stopped giving smallpox vaccines because there's no need at this point. Polio was eradicated in the Americas, South America, North America, uh, Central America, in 1994. Measles. The endemic of measles has been eradicated in the United States. We can still get it from outside the country. People will bring it in. We can still get it. We can still get measles. So another reason it's important to be vaccinated with that. HPV, um, I think they, they said that something like 250 million people have been vaccinated with that when it, when it first started. It, it was a, it's a of, Including men and women. Men and women, because you both get it. And, and I'll tell you something. I believe I heard something like upwards of 70 to 80 percent of the population has it. You don't even know it. Yeah, and uh, the only way you know it is if you get a lesion or cervical cancer or something like that. That's why it's important. So the cervical cancer is the big one. You want to, you want to try to prevent. So didn't they reverse the whole thing of stopping having pap smears for women when they came to some bridge? They said, oh, you don't need them anymore. And then they reversed it. Yeah. I, I don't, I, I'm they not familiar with that, but I would, yes. I would say that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Now we circle back to the coronavirus. Um, this is a this is a very nasty virus. It has some really strange and devastating effects. Um, when it first came out, you had a lot of people on ventilators. If you ever seen a person on the ventilator, um, it's it's a horrible situation. They tend to put them face down because it eases the pressure on your lungs. Um, you can't clear your lungs. People can get early onset Alzheimer's symptoms. They get the fatigue that can last for months and months and months. You can get a COVID toe. Um, you can get blood dysgrasias. You get like a uh, embolisms, clotting. Uh, your heart can enlarge. Um, it's 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 nasty and it and it, it attacks aggressively. Um, so it's really not a respiratory virus. It's, it's a, it attacks all your body systems, right? It, it, well, so it, it, it's. It's respiratory in its transmission. The vector, the vector. Yeah, yeah. The vector is respiratory. You're gonna, you're gonna. Somebody's gonna cough. You're gonna get it. You're gonna get it. But it attacks everything. Like it's, 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 it's 
very strange. Right? It's, it's something we, you know, I've never seen this in all my years as, as a pharmacist, you know. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, it's fascinating because you can actually watch evolution in almost real time with this thing. Because you can see over the years, how over three years, it's changed to a point where um, it's still bad. But if you get sick with coronavirus now, it's probably going to feel more like a bad cold. Um, not many people are being ventilated anymore. I mean, a lot of that has to do with being vaccinated too, and your body's able to fight it. Um, and all the things we did, wearing masks and so on and so forth. But um, it's, like I said, viruses, I hate to give it a human component, but it doesn't want to die. So, but it wants to be transmissible. And the way this does it is through the airborne. Um, what is that picture? Actually? Those are the spikes. Those are the corona spikes. Is that, 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 that helps it, 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 it helps it to adhere, it helps it to, adhere to um, your cells. And it so helps that, it, that's a blown up picture of something that's the real thing. minuscule. Yeah. Minuscule to an extreme yeah. point. But it actually looks like that. Yeah. That, that can get inside of a bacteria cell. And bacteria cells are pretty small. Yeah, and that will attach to your body, you know, your, your cells. Yeah, well, yeah. Pretty, pretty, pretty devastating. <laughs> um, the first virus, uh, vaccine was given to uh, Sarah Lindy in uh, New York. She was at the, um, uh, the Long Beach, or Long Island, Long Beach uh, Jewish Hospital. Um, she got that. She got a vaccine on, uh, on December 14th. I had the vaccine in my store on the 23rd, 24th. Eight days later, Moderna, which is the same technology. And it tends to be a little more potent with its side effects. It's the same. You get the same uh, protection, but you. This one tends to give you more day after side effects. We don't do this one at my store. We do, we're a Pfizer exclusive. So this is, this is something this town can be pretty proud of. That's a, that's a delivery box for the, uh, that's the first delivery box of the vaccine that came to my store. Um, we were what's known as a hub store. We would uh, store the vaccine in my store in the freezer box. And the immunizers would come and collect it and go out to the nursing homes and facilities where the people were getting the vaccines. Um, that is 90 below zero inside that box. Oh. It's packed with dry ice. You can only open it for three minutes at a time, and you can only do that twice a day. You have to wear all the protective gear, gloves, mask, all that stuff, because you can get frostbite by touching it. There's a transponder underneath the lid of that thing. And when it would come in, I'd have to turn off the transponder to let Pfizer know that we got it, it was safe, and they, they monitor it the whole way there. So now it's with me, and now we're responsible for it. And I had the, the vaccine had to stay in that box until we needed it. We had to know how many shots we were giving. Each vial would give six shots as long as you're doing what's called a vanish point syringe, which has uh, no air gap to lose vaccine. Um, and so you had to know how many virus vaccines you're going to give at the nursing homes. And we'd, we'd have to pull them out in the morning and get them all set up and they go in the refrigerator. They come in with these things called aero bags. They were, they were a high tech um, uh, insulated bag. And when I tell you these things were, were, would keep things cold, I had an ice pack in one one time and I had extra bags in the pharmacy. I had an ice pack that I put in there that was frozen. Shut it up and I set the bag aside and I forgot about it. And then I was setting up a bag with somebody. A week later I opened that bag up and that thing was like still frozen. It's amazing. I want one for the beach. For your beer. But it's probably like a two thousand dollar yeah for my beer. That box right there was delivered by a resident of New of North Reading, and I won't say his name because I haven't talked to him about it. But he's a he's a Federal Express driver. And he came walking in with that thing, and I looked at him, I smiled, I said, "You got to be kidding." Two North Reading boys getting the first virus, uh, virus getting the first vaccine. Was it scary getting it? You know what's scary is opening it and setting a timer. It's like diffusing a bomb. You know, I mean, I'm serious about that. You, you open the thing up and you're like, somebody set a timer. Okay, you, got, you only have three minutes. And 
and taking out 20 vials and counting them and then making sure that they go into a bag quickly and go into the refrigerator quickly until they get there uh, was really unnerving. And we also get, you can see a box next to it. The box next to it is all the supplies we get from the government. The federal government would send us all the syringes, all the masks, all the, everything we needed to give the shots. And it, was, it would come every single time. And those vaccine cards you get, they would always send us a brick of those. I've got so many vaccine cards right now, I could probably vaccinate the entire population of this, of this country <laughs> and, and give them each a card. I, we're not going to use them anymore. But um, They would also send a box of dry ice. And I had to replenish the dry ice every three or four days or so uh, to keep it frozen. And so that was the number two opening. And sometimes it got to be a challenge. We try to do removal of vaccine and, and dry ice within three minutes. And we always did. We always, we always had plenty of time left. It wasn't that bad. The vaccines now, and th that was a two-part vaccine. You, you got the, the, the vaccine and you had to put a daily one in, on the site. You had to reconstitute it. They now come constituted. We, we, they, they come all ready to go except for the children's. The children's ones, uh, we have to mix up still. But we can put the vaccines now in the refrigerator for up to 10 weeks. So they still come in the same box, but now I go in with my bare hands, I open it up, and I don't, who cares? You know, at this point, we're so used to doing it, we, we can do it without hurting ourselves, but it's like, you know, but it still comes with the transponder and the whole thing. Uh, and we have to return the boxes generally. Um, but I got to tell you, um, it was a very, very difficult time. We, I'm not going to say we put our lives on the line, but we were exposed to coronavirus almost on a daily basis. I had a woman standing in front of me who was sweating and coughing in the beginning, and and she was fear, you know, she was just a mess. And she goes, "What do I do?" I said, "I went in, I got a mask. I said, put this on and get out of my store. Go and get in your car and go to the hospital. Go see a do the doctor. I mean, you know." It, we get that. I mean, people people will come for their Paxlovid vaccine, their Paxlovid um, antiviral medication. They'll walk into my store without a mask with COVID, and they'll be like, "I'm here for my medicine." I said, "Is it for you?" Yeah. <laughs> my all my technicians and, and partners have had COVID at least once or twice. I've had it twice that I know of. I probably had it more than that, but just you never know, tested positive. Um, the first year it came out. Uh, that summer, I had a physical with my doctor, and I said, can you just test me for antibodies just because, you know, I'm exposed? And he says, yeah, but nobody's ever tested positive. He called me the next day. He says, you're positive for antibodies. Never knew I had it. Never knew I had it. Um, the second time I was, it was this past August, and I, and I had a cough and a sniffle, and so I'm exposed so much, and I, I'm around old people, old, older people. <laughs> a lot. So I thought that, you won't be killed yeah, yeah. So I so I thought to protect them, you know, I should test. Second day of vacation in August in Newburyport, I tested positive. So now I'm quarantining my house for five days with beautiful sunshine out there, and I'm like, oh. Yeah. So I called my I called my bosses. I kind of do over, you know, because everybody else gets the day off. I don't. That's me getting the first COVID shot um, from all my staff and the people I know. The immunizers got them first, and then we vaccinated healthcare professionals, anybody that had um, severe Im immunocompromised situations. Um, I took one for the team. Um, my, my staff were kind of nervous about it. And uh, that's Ben Fred. He was, he was a, an immunizer for all the nursing homes and stuff, and he came back, and what we'd do is they go out to the nursing homes, they give the shots, and they come back and invariably there'd be some leftover vaccine. We couldn't give it to the general public because we had to do teachers and firemen and policemen and hospital workers and things like that. Um, so all the pharmacy staff got the shots that came back that were left over. And it got to a point where we, we would call our district manager and she would call around the pharmacies and does anybody need one? And they'd come over. And you only have a certain amount of time to give it. They could be out of the. They could be out of the uh, box. I believe it was for like six hours, um, out of the uh, cooler, the aero bags for about. I think it was like six hours. So they'd come back and they'd have. You got a half an hour to get this. Right. 
then what do you do? I mean, I can't, you know, we can't give it to somebody in the store that's walking around the aisles. We have to, you know, I would have loved to. Um, but um, so we, we had all these pharmacists coming in and we give them the vaccines and that was the, that was the first one. And I, and I, poor choice of masks. <laughs> I'm getting a shot of the corona, of the, of the vaccine, and the, I make bad decisions. <laughs> now this is a slide my brother did. This is a slide my brother did. Last May I had a, I had a, um, and I left it because I thought it was kind of funny. I actually had massive bilateral pulmonary embolisms last May. Oh. It could have been caused by uh, the virus. Um, I didn't test positive, but I have no, I have no history of it in my, myself. My, my blood test came back that I'm not, I'm not prone to it. Uh, it. It was massive, and I'm going for the sympathy here, life-threatening. My doctor told me flip a coin if you didn't get treated. You, you could have died. I was in the hospital for a couple days. It wasn't painful. I was fine. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, <laughs> But um, I passed out that morning. Before I uh, before I went to work, <laughs> and I didn't. And I drove to work, and I got to work, and I couldn't breathe. And so I called my boss and said, "I can't breathe. I don't know what's going on." <laughs> so what do you do when you feel sick? You call your mommy. <laughs> my mommy was here in North Reading, so I said, "Mommy, can you take me to the doctor? I think I have a boo boo." <laughs> um, so my mom took me to the health center and then there was an ambulance ride to Winchester and then from Winchester to the Lee Clinic because it was pretty pretty bad. Um, and one of my one of my brothers actually uh, caught COVID and ended up with an embolism. So it, it can be it can be due to that. I also was on an airplane flight too, which is also not uh, so I'm going to get my money. Um, but um, that was uh, that, that, that it, it's scary what this thing can do to um, that's that's pretty much what I've got. I can tell you a quick little funny story about my mom. I'm sure she wouldn't mind me telling you this, but uh, my mom was one of the first pre people I vaccinated for the, the virus. We had some leftover virus. She has um, comorbidities, so she was um, eligible, but we weren't really doing it to the public. And so we had about a half an hour to give the shot. And so I called my boss and I said, listen, my mom's right here in town. I can get her over here. Um, like in five minutes, I only have a certain amount of time to get a shot. He says, no. And I said, why not? He says, I don't like the optics, because it's your mom, you're giving her a shot, it's not gonna look good if people find out. I said, do you think it would be better if I throw that, that vaccine away? And he says, you're right, go ahead. So I felt guilty about it. There was nobody else I could give it to at that particular moment. So my mom came with my brother, and I gave her a shot. And uh, I had her go sit down, 15 minutes. And my brother's out there with her. And I'm going about, I'm typing away, and I kept glancing over, and she was okay. And after about 10 minutes, I, my brother's fine, says, she's got a question for you. I went over, and my mom's over there like this. Oh, and God. And I'm, Mom, Mom, I thought I killed my mother. <laughs> I go right out, like, Mom, Mom, I hit her. And she goes, what? And I go, what the hell are you doing? And she smirks at me and goes, I was sleeping. <laughs> and when I tell you I'm glad I wore my brown pants that day. <laughs> I had two more hours of work and I drove and I go to New Report, so I'm kind of in New Report. I'm like this all the way home. Yeah, so the next time when I gave her her booster, I went in straight and came out of an angle. And that's how you go. She, she was also my probably my first or second real shot that I gave when we first had her shots. And one thing when you give it, when you give an immunization of any kind, a shot of any kind, um, invariably you're gonna find somebody you're gonna hit bone. You're gonna go in and you're gonna hit bone. You do not feel it at all. I do, and it's gross. It's like hitting a rock. And you go and you, and you don't want to, you can't react, and you're not supposed to tell them that you hit bone. You just pull back a little bit and give it to them. I hit bone with my mom. <laughs> and so she goes, oh, that was great. I didn't feel a thing. I said, and I said to her, yeah, I hit bone. Wow. <gasps> oh, oh, and I'm like, are you kidding? You didn't know I hit bone until I told you that. That's my mom. Yes, it is. Yeah, so I've vaccinated pretty much my entire family. I'm sure I've vaccinated a lot of people in this room. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, <laughs> because you brought up the experimentation on children, yes. and I've been on the human uh, subjects uh, committee, yeah. can you make sure everybody understands that we don't do that? Oh, God, no. Yeah. Just yeah. explain what yeah. the human subject oh. process is for any kind yeah. of research. They're, they're, they're all volunteers. With a, a signed consent. And right. Oh, informed. absolutely. Absolutely. I'm yeah. sure these folks know, but oh, yeah, yeah. It yeah, no, absolutely. Said, it, there's, we talked about all that. There's no trials. Yeah. There's yeah. no medical trials that are not consent based. You, you just can't do it. Well, you yeah. may not be getting the active ingredients. And you may not be getting the active ingredients. Correct. Yeah, that's a placebo. But I will say that if they find something that they develop that shows negative over the over the top success, success, they stop that. They stop right there and they start giving everybody the, the or stuff. the other side. Right. That they find exactly. The exactly. 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 Yeah, I think that I think that's sort of they, they accelerated the uh, the corona. They just did the studies differently. This should have taken the corona the, the vaccine for coronavirus should have taken ten years, seven to ten years. It's a it's it's a it's a miracle. It's a miracle vaccine. And and just to let you know how really cool this technology is, they're talking about developing cancer treatments for this. So what they could do is they could take a cancer cell out of your body and somehow extract. The, the, the messenger RNA. Now, messenger RNA, all that is is basically software. Right? It codes to make something. And so, when that gets into your that gets into your cells, it pirates your um, your cells machinery and tells it to make these things, make another virus, whatever. So, the vaccine. I, I, just, I actually just read this today. I, I actually I honestly didn't know how this was made. It takes 60 days from start to finish to, to make that vaccine. It takes them one hour to change it. Like if, if, the, if the virus mutates again, it'll take them an hour to come up with a new one. It'll take them another 60 days to actually make the, the vaccine available. But the process for it happening goes all over the country, and it's all freezer-based. It's freezer boxes going all over the place. But interestingly enough, <laughs> Pfizer has a, a lab in Andor, and that's where they actually take the, the DNA um, uh, ring break it and straighten it out, and that's where they extract the messenger RNA. It's got nothing to do with your DNA. It does not affect your DNA whatsoever. It's messenger RNA, which is part of DNA, but what that is, it's just code to make something. Um, and it goes from, from Andover back to like Kalamazoo, Michigan, and then they, they start processing. The, the 60 days it takes to make that, half of that is quality control. They have 100 cameras pointing at the vials as they're going by before they mix them. If there's any cracks or chips or anything, those virus, those vaccine vials are gone. Um, and they test the messenger RNA to make sure it's what's supposed to be constant. It's, it's, it's a miracle. It's a miracle vaccine. And they've been studying it for 30 years. It's not anything really, really new. It's new in its use, but not new technology. So, yes. The other part of the technology that is really relevant is we're looking at the vaccine, which is the medical department's part. Look at all the other technology with the shipping, with the packaging, with every part. The country just turned out in all technology in all areas to make something happen. It yep. was one of the fastest we've ever done. Yep. It's a miracle. It really is a miracle. You know? And and it, and and it and it, it it works extraordinarily well. Yeah. And, and and I will tell you that the, the um, the, the antiviral, the Paxlovid, works extraordinarily well. It's it, like it, it's ninety five percent effective. Um, you can still get some side effects. They have Paxlovid mouth that you know your mouth gets all dry and weird and stuff. And you can also get rebound COVID. So a week after you finish your Paxlovid, you can get COVID again. You know that happened to the president, and his wife. But they're they're actually rare uh, for that to happen. But um, but I do have to say it's been it's been an amazing three years. I would definitely say I would not want to do it again. Uh, I am actually still giving first doses of Pfizer vaccine to adults. Brain dead adults. Well, no, no, they're getting their vaccine. No, I don't, I don't care. Look, I, I'm like, I'm the person that says, you know, I don't, I don't care. You know, if you're getting the vaccine, and I don't care what else you say. You're getting the vaccine. You know, I'm good with that. I've had people come in. Oh, my work is making me do it. And, you know, and they're. They're fighting and stuff, and I said, "Hey, look, I don't look. You're doing it. You know, this is this is important." 
But Tim, in my, say, in public health school, uh, in my epidemiology class in 1978 or 79 or, no, 77, the prediction was for this kind of event to occur yeah. in the future. There was full knowledge of how um, viruses can explode and wipe a whole society out. Yeah. But that you can't deal with it until it happens. Right. And that's why, the, that's why this vaccine is coming up now, is because there was really no reason to use it in recent knowledge. So this was, this was a use for it. And it's basically, they were able to do their experiments, their trials, in real time with you know, real stuff. And, uh, and, uh, and I got to say, I, so, so I, I vaccinated, I think I, I, one time I thought about, I vaccinated, I vaccinated thousands and thousands of people, but I figured out one day, each needle is about an inch, and if you lay those needles end to end, you probably go from here to Boston <laughs> in one needle. You know, I've given so many. Um, my but isn't there the shock of a lifetime that doctors who supervise my resident doctor wouldn't take the vaccine? Yeah, uh, I, you know, I, I don't. I'm a proponent of the vaccine. You know, but, but if you're a health professional physician, health professionals, if you're going to be dealing training with people, other doctors yeah if you're going to be dealing with people um, there's a responsibility that you should take to be vaccinated and not just for this but for pretty much anything you can be they got fired yeah. um, but right now um, we have authorized technicians to vaccinate so I've got a couple of technicians that vaccine I, I, she didn't want me to show up but my second vaccine and my third were done by one of my technicians um, and I I cannot tell you how proud I am of my, my staff at work. What they went through in the last three years um, was scary for them. Um, it's exhausting when we do clinics. I mean, if you've ever been into my store when we're doing a clinic, the lines go out the door, people are, are frustrated, they're aggravated, the scripts get falling behind. It's, it's you know, I can't, I can't tell you. If you see technicians in the store <laughs> stressing out, they're, they're, it's true, it, this, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mess. And I'm so proud of my staff. Those, those kids just, they, I, I liken it to look, I'm, I'm like the Tom Cruise, all right? I'm, I'm the star, you know? People, people are like, oh, this Timmy, you know? And, but Tom Cruise wouldn't be Tom Cruise without the directors and makeup men and the gaffers and the, all, everybody makes him look good. He just gets up there and says something and that's it. That's me. I, I have an important role. I have to make sure everything's going right, but, all the work is done by my technicians, and they bust their butt. They bust their butt. Don't, don't ever think that they're not doing anything back there. It's not just slapping a label on a bottle and handing it to you. It's, it's, these guys do a lot of work. And then they add the fact that they, they want to do shots on top of that. You know. Unionized. Try, I try not to, when, when you get people coming to vaccines, I try not to make them do it. I try to do it myself. Yeah. Yes? Why have they not come up with a vaccine for RSV? Um, there is. I think there is a vaccine now. They've, they've recently, I think, they, I think they've come out with a vaccine recently for RSV. Um, I, it might be in trials right now. Um, yeah, I, I think they do though. I think, I, I, I want to say that, I've read, we don't do it at my store. So Remind that, us what it stands for. Huh? Remind us what it stands for. Uh, it's respiratory single virus. There you go, thank you. I didn't know. That? <laughs> respiratory virus. My great, great so great niece got it. She was a preemie. My great niece got it. Yeah. And she was she was fine. But yeah, that's the other thing. We, we 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 got hit with a, a trifecta. Now we got that. We got the COVID, and then the um, the flu was hit with gangbusters. So yeah. yeah, and we and we Tylenol. Yeah. Yes. One quick question. One thing I was reading about the history of vaccines is. More recently, they changed the definition of what a vaccine does. Like, you know, vaccine, we're talking about how it would like, cure you and you couldn't get it again. And, and you couldn't transmit it. And, you know, with the COVID vaccine, it doesn't stop transmission. Right. Not so, so, but that was a, that the old, yeah. if you look at the old definition of, of yeah. vaccination, it was right. you were cured, you couldn't, you know, if you got a polio yeah. vaccine, you couldn't get polio again. Right. But, the, but this, this is different. They, they changed the definition. So the yeah. question is, is there like a subset of definitions, like you're going to get a vaccine, like a polio vaccine is right. a vaccine of the old type that we right. know. The COVID is a, like a treatment to lessen your symptoms you don't get. 
Well, well COVID is, is a vaccine. It, it, it elicits an immune but response. But I'm saying it's not like the vaccines we talked like from the beginning. Yeah, they, you're right. They, they had to change the definition a little bit because the COVID vaccine isn't necessary. You're not... You're not it doesn't stop transmission from one... Well, <laughs> none, none of the vaccines will stop transmission. When you... When you so if I get a polio vaccine, I could transmit. Right. Yeah, but, not, but, but the thing is also, they're saying now that if you go to a country that has active polio, like in the Middle East, there's still polio, they recommend that you get, if you've had been vaccinated, they recommend you get another vaccine against it. It'll protect you against it. Uh, but, but transmission, um, I don't think any virus, any vaccine is going to prevent you from it. But that was the old definition. It said, like, it would, if you got vaccinated, yeah, like with yeah. some of these, you know, smallpox, whatever, you were cured. You couldn't, you couldn't yeah. get it, you couldn't transmit it. Yeah, well, smallpox was cured. It's eradicated. So, th th it, that so if you got a small packs vaccine, you're protected. Right. You couldn't yeah. like get a you know, relapse. Of, right. you know. and, and and like, but there's also some viruses that you get that will never leave your body. Chickenpox. You have chickenpox for life. Yeah. Yeah. Herpes. Yeah. Herpes. Or then, or then you get shingles after. Well, you don't get the shingles. It's the shingles are right. chickenpox. Right. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. It right. resurfaces the shingles. Right. Right. It lives on the nerve and it travels down the nerve. That's why it hurts so bad because it inflames that nerve ending. It's a nice one. And they tell me it's like yeah. being on fire without the benefit of fire. Shingles. So, I hear it's like one of the worst things. I mean, oh yeah, that's why that's why you should get a shingles vaccine if you haven't had it. If you're 50 and older, they recommend getting a shingles vaccine because it, it helps boost your immune. Yes. I think one of the things we have to realize is we're fighting to survive in life, and so aren't these organisms, and they're smart. That's why they change and morph and form, and we have to figure a new way to attach them. The ones that we talk about when you talk about the early years here or you talk about the bubonic plague or centuries before, for centuries we have had major plagues like this over the centuries and they will happen again and they'll show up in another form that we haven't anticipated because right. they'll figure another way to get to yeah. us to survive. Yeah. 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 And that's what's so insidious about viruses. The viruses aren't alive. They don't actually think that way. They just kind of mutate into the different things and you know, become less virulent or more transmissible or, you know, some of them, you know, make your skin turn blue, I don't know, you grow a tail when you get it, it just has, who knows what these things are. Do you ever think about that we'll be able to go to hospitals and not have to wear a mask? I don't think that's going to happen. And, and it's sort of a good thing in a way because yeah. the worst infection you will ever get is an infection inside of a hospital. It's called iatrogenesis. Yeah, and I think it's a nosocomial infection is the infection they got. And because viruses and bacteria that survive in a hospital, they've survived some pretty heavy duty <laughs> antibiotics. Yeah. 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 And so you don't want to get an infection in a hospital. Oh, okay. One other thing about the difference between a hospital setting and a nursing home setting is that nursing homes were designed for chronic care. And none of them had hand washing stations right in the front door. So my mom was in a rehab uh, nursing home unit where I took more protection to protect me than the staff had been guided to take protection for themselves or to engage with at the very, very beginning. Because of design, they're in close quarters and for chronic disease and not for communicable disease. So that's why it flew through uh, long-term care facilities. Yeah. 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 When did when did it, like CBS stop the mask mandate for you guys? I don't even remember. Oh. I mean, we we wore them till. I mean, even when the mask mandate stopped, we were required by CBS to keep wearing yeah. them. Yeah. Um, the only time I ever wear a mask now is if I'm giving uh, a vaccination to somebody who's wearing a mask. Uh, we don't even have to do that. Yeah. Uh, but as far as hospitals, I mean, if I was going to go into a hospital, mm -hmm. I'd probably wear a mask regardless. I'd probably wear a mask on an airplane. Yeah. Uh, you're in a tube in the sky. Yeah. And their but filtration they system. They're saying that the infiltration system yeah. is yeah. superior, but whatever. Yeah, it doesn't keep you from the guy next to you coughing and sneezing right on you. Yeah, so. Well, I know that we could talk this all night long. I do. So but, why? But I don't but I get to, to move. But I get to work late. Oh, okay. So. But this was awesome. I'm giving it to you. And I say it's being taped. It'll be on, on eventually. It'll be posted.
posted on Noel Cam's YouTube. Well, I'll send the link out to everybody. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And there's food, and you can still pin them down and ask them questions. Pin them down. And obviously, go to CVS and pin them down and ask questions while you're